Hey guys, so in the last episode we talked about frames and motion systems of 3D printers and we got some great feedback from your comments. One thing that really wasn't mentioned that we should have mentioned was the belts on 3D printers and now most Cartesian style printers have these six millimeter belts. They're pretty normal and it's fine for Cartesians, but with the Core XY, they use much thicker belts like this one, which is 10 millimeters. This is because with this motor system, there is a risk of stretching at the belts. So larger ones just spread the force out to prevent this. There is also extra grip with the large surface area on the pulleys and eithers that prevent any slippage. Creality offers some 10 millimeter belts from their Core XY machines, so we're using these. For the larger printer, the frame is nicely assembled and we've added these little profiles on the bottom to keep some distance between the bottom of the printer and the work surface that you're using. And we've also added these cute little TPU boots because I, I kept knocking the bottom of the printer against the workbench and I, I don't want it to get scratched, so these are really cool. And ooh, it would be cool if we actually printed real boots for this. Okay, let's do that next time. Today's video, though, we'll be talking about hot ends, extruders, and heated beds. And we mentioned briefly in the last episode that we, we need these steel rods to stabilize the bed. Um, easy peasy, though. We just have a printed part here that will connect to the aluminum profile, and we're going to have one in each corner. And we're also going to connect those to the bed with these little bearings. So, easy peasy. This is not as important on the little printer as it is for the big one. The little one has a really, really small bed. We will be using two of these at the back, but we don't need one in each corner because it is so small. And then that brings us to motors. So for a Z motor, Creality use a 4234 motor for pretty much all of their Z movements, even if it's just the normal Ender 3, which has a relatively light gantry, or if it's an Ender 5 Plus, which has a really big bed and also a glass surface. So we are gonna use these. We're gonna follow in their footsteps and use a 4234 in dual mode for our bed. Now, what bed you choose actually comes down to more of a personal choice because, well, a lot of beds are the same besides the size. Although, but not all, and we'll get to that. We're gonna be using a CR Tennis Pro V2 bed. It's a 310 by 320 bed, relatively large, uh, but you can get lots of matching surfaces for it, which is quite useful. Uh, if you are choosing a bed size that is non-standard, make sure that you can actually get a surface that fits because a lot of surfaces these days can't be cut. These steel sheets are such an example. These are spring steel. This one's a Prusa one, but there are others in, the, in their shop that you can get. Uh, it's wonderful, great adhesion, double-sided. You can get it in textured and smooth surfaces. That's, they're fantastic, I love them, but you can't cut them, they're steel. You know, you can't just put a scissors with it. It's unfortunate. And that isn't gonna be an issue with our little printer. So it has the tiniest of beds, really, really tiny. This is 100 by 100 millimeters. So we don't have any PEI sheets for this. Uh, you can get them online, but what we're gonna be doing is using our normal uh, flexible surface and we can cut that with the scissors, which is great. So I already got the magnetic base put on. All I can do is slap on the top surface. Perfect. So for the Creality bed, it has these great screw holes that are beveled for countersunk screws, but unfortunately for the little bed, it doesn't have these, it just has screw holes. So what we need to do is to snip the corners uh, of the magnetic face so we can actually fit uh, the screws in. Another issue you might face with beds is the kind of connections. So with the Creality bed, everything is fine, it's done. We have an integrated thermistor and heater and a ground wire as well. But for the little bed, uh, we just have a heater. There's no uh, thermistor at all, which is unfortunate. Now you can use whatever thermistor you like. You can just change it in the firmware to, to suit which one you've put in. But for us, we're just gonna use a standard glass bead 100K thermistor that comes with many Creality printers like an Ender 3. Now what we're doing is gonna put it on the back and hold it in place with Captain Tape. I'm no chemist, but when my children need a flexible, heat-resistant polyimide, I choose Captain. Additionally, the heater connections might be troubling for some people. We just got cables and connections, that's it. So we're gonna have to do some soldering. I hate soldering, I hate soldering, I hate soldering, I hate soldering. I'm a little sensitive about this, so be kind. Can we do a close-up? No! As for the heater cables, keep in mind which cables you're using. Higher power beds will require more heavy duty cabling and smaller beds less so. There are a lot of details online that you can find, a lot of tutorials and guides. 
I don't want to go into too much detail here about how to do this. This is relatively basic electronics, um, but just keep it in mind when you are putting your bed together. Another difference between the big bed and the little bed is the power consumption. So there's a lot of power going through this guy, a lot of wattage compared to the little bed that we have here. And this can pose a problem for the, for the big bed, I mean. Uh, so there's a lot of wattage going through and therefore a lot of current and the main board can't handle that much current. For the little bed, it's totally fine, but for the big one, it's just an issue. Uh, if you were to do this, it would just burn out the main board. So instead, we are using this. This is a SSR, a solid state relay, which is basically a switch. SSRs are really useful because this can handle 10, 20, 30 amps of current, so your main board will not burn out. One of the problems with SSRs is the wiring, though. It's not immediately intuitive to someone who's not familiar with electronics how to wire this uh, because it's wired in parallel so one of the ssr outputs uh, goes to the negative of the power supply and the other to the negative terminal on the bed and then the bed's positive terminal connects to the power supply other possible beds you could get would be an ac powered bed and this means the power is coming directly from the wall socket or rather there is a double connection on the power supply's AC input terminals. Like the big bed, you need an SSR to direct the power there. A signal comes from the main board, but the power itself comes from the AC terminals on your power supply. These have advantages like really fast heating. Remember, you're pushing 240 volts into this bed instead of 24 volts or 12 volts if you're old school. A lot of them can go a lot hotter as well, so maybe up to 130 degrees. The artillery printers like the Sidewinder and the Genius range actually have these AC beds. You can also use a thermal fuse for extra safety. Now, this is essentially a fuse that breaks when it reaches a certain temperature. Now, this is quite useful if your SSR fails because if that happens, the bed can just keep heating up and there's nothing gonna stop it except the firmware. The last thing to worry about with beds is bed leveling. Now we will be using a BL touch for leveling for both printers, but whether you want a manual auxiliary function with screws at the corners is up to you. There are disadvantages for having this as the screws will gradually loosen over time, uh, but every micrometer crowds, so it might be an idea not to have this. However, for the sake of redundancy, we would really like to have these leveling screws. It's just useful if something fails and you need a backup. So that's heated beds done. Next up is hot ends and extruders, and this also comes down to a lot of personal choice. First up though, is whether you want to have a Bowden or a direct drive system. I like Bowdens because they simplify the whole extrusion system. The extruders are kept well away from the hot ends and their weight becomes irrelevant to printer performance. Because of this, it is easier to maintain both the extruder and the hot end. Take for example, our Prusa here. Now the Prusa is a wonderful printer, but its direct drive setup is a bit complicated. If you want to do maintenance on the hot end, you need to remove the part cooling fan, a screw from the heat sink fan, several printed parts and more screws. But if you were doing maintenance on a Bowden setup, you only need to unscrew two or three screws and you have access to the extruder gear. Same with the hot end, you've just removed the fan shred and you have access to it. So the direct drives are a bit complicated compared to Bowden's, but I do like direct drives because they have smoother extrusion, they eliminate all problems with the PTFE, and they're easier to print with for flexible filaments, for instance. So we will be using a direct drive on both of our printers. Uh, Bowdens are just too easy anyway, so we want to do something cool. There are a bunch of hot ends and extruders for you to choose from. It might seem a little overwhelming to see our whole range if you're not that familiar with extruders. Firstly, you can get a hot end and extruder combo. This greatly simplifies things as the connection between an extruder and the hot end can get a bit finicky, and there are a bunch of STLs to choose from for mounting these on various printers. Options available are the Hemera or the Revo Hemera, which makes nozzle changes super easy. You could get a premium Bontec slice engineering combo like the Shortcut Mosquito. These are quite expensive, but they are some of the most reliable on the market. You could also get something from the BQH2 range. They have a bunch more budget-friendly options, with one being the H2B2S Revo, also being integrated into the E3D Revo system, which makes nozzle changing really quick. The Micro Swiss also have a cool budget option like the NG extruder, which is superbly suited for flexible filament. However, we have decided to make our own extruder to maximize performance, but also to watch out for space and budget constraints, especially when it comes to our little printer. I actually use Blender to create this, but that was a terrible idea and I'm clearly some kind of masochist because of this. Blender is beautiful. I, I love it. I was born and raised by Blender, but it's not the best choice for product design. If you're seriously considering designing your own extruder, I would recommend something like Fusion 360. 
especially for these little things in printers. We're taking inspiration from community designs like the Sherpa Mini Extruder or the Orbiter Extruder, and these use a small round NEMA 14 motor instead of the normal NEMA 17s that we're used to on most printers. Some extruders like the Orbiter actually use a planetary gear instead of the normal two spur gear approach. Using a planetary gear system allows you to make your extruder a lot more compact, but it also just looks really cool. We actually have a Sherpa Mini kit in our shop and all you need here is the motor and the printed parts. There are also other kinds of gearing systems like a harmonic drive, which uses a flexible spline to step down the gears. The Prusa XL will have this kind of approach and we're very excited to see it. But rather than complicate things, we're going to use a normal spur gear approach by taking a Bantech BMG kit and melding it with a NEMA 14 motor. Now these NEMA 14s have these hard set primary gears. You can find these all over the internet. NEMA 14s have an 11 tooth primary gear. These ones do anyway. Couple that with a 51 tooth BMG palm gear and you have a five to one gear ratio. And what the hell is a gear ratio? Well, I'm glad you asked because it makes things even more confusing when you're choosing your own extruder. So in lots of extruders, there's one small gear that turns a much larger gear. And the larger gear turns a lot slower than the smaller gear, but its torque is increased while the speed is decreased. What's torque? Well. It's sort of like force, but the circular motion version of force. Now you obviously need some force to move the filament, but too much torque is not always a good thing. For instance, if you upgrade your Ender 3 to have a Bontech BMG extruder, you actually have to decrease the current going to the motor by around 40% because there is too much torque and it will just push the PTFE tube out of the extruder. It really all depends on the motor you have chosen for your extruder. An Ender 3 extruder motor has around 40 newton centimeters of torque, but the NEMA 14 has around 8 to 10. That's bigger. So all NEMA 14 or similar motors need to have a higher gear ratio to boost that torque. Expect these kind of motors to have extruders with gear ratios higher than 3 to 1, like a BMG, which uses a regular NEMA 17 motor or a NEMA 17 pancake style motor. So that brings us to hot ends. And once again, you're spoiled for choice in our shop. Lightweight rules still apply, of course. So we'll be using the Revo a micro hot end. This is a really, really tiny hot end with an easy to remove nozzle. And one cool thing is that you can just screw into an M12 thread with a nut placed on top to keep it secure. So you can design and a hot end mount that has an M12 thread and literally you just screw it in. Don't worry, it's not a groove mount. This can be then integrated into your extruder with a short PTFE tube. Revos have this quick change nozzle feature which makes things way simpler and the heater has what's called a positive temperature coefficient which means the resistance increases as the temperature does. So hitting that final temperature is much more exact and also safer. But for the little more budget conscious printer that we're going to create, we are going to use something that we have done before. And in a previous video, we tested a Creality hot end with a volcano block, a bimetallic heat break, and a CHT nozzle, and it worked beautifully. So that's what we're going to do again. And it's not as compact as the Revo Micro, but it is cheaper and it's a good way of learning about how hot ends work because the hot end itself is totally modular and really easy to swap parts with. We've got a lot of hot ends in the shop, and if you're not sure which one would suit you best, then just let us know. We have some that are uniquely suited to flexible filaments, some for high flow printers, some that are tiny, some that are suited only to specific printers, and some that are easy to install on pretty much any printer. So just send us a message if you want any further info or assistance. So that is everything on extruders, hot ends, and heated beds. Next time we'll be integrating every little thing and the frame for the little printer will be unveiled. And I really want to tell you more about it because it's so cool, but let's keep it a surprise. We'll unveil it then and also talk about firmware, mainboards and the other electronics. Just like last time, guys, please let us know if we missed anything or if you think that something should be added to it. We'll talk about it in the comments and bring it up in the next video. Until then, later. Oh, 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 oh,